All right, everyone, good evening. Today is Sunday, October 4th, and we're going to run through swaps, both CDS, CDX, IRS, TTS, basis, repo, and dollar rolls. So a whole alphabet soup of different products that are very interesting and exciting to talk about. All right, to kick things off, let's talk about what credit derivatives are. So a credit derivative is, as the name would entail, a derivative, which means it's a bilateral contractual risk transfer with value derived from the credit performance of a, corp a corporation, sovereign, or security. And what that means in plain English is that you are basically exchanging risk with someone else. And with that in mind, you're going to get some sort of payoff. So the idea is it's like insurance. I'm going to give you a payment um, periodically. And then if something goes wrong, the other counterparty has to make a larger payment. So um, if you see the timeline on your screen, you see that they're invented in 1992, um, pretty quiet for a while. Uh, but by the early 2000s, we saw issuance go skyrocketing through the roof between 2001 and 2007. Um, I guess it was up, what is that, 120 fold, 100, 100 fold. So that is a huge jump there. However, um, being a focal point for the crisis, because you can, effectively sit synthetically short a bond that you don't have to have. There's this whole idea of not necessarily having the aligned risks and the aligned incentives that a typical bondholder would have in this process. Because as we're gonna go into, you can sit synthetically long a bond that you don't own or sit, sit synthetically short a bond that you don't own as well. So um, the whole idea is if you're just doing a synthetic trade, then that's a naked trade. So your naked CDS was banned in the European Union in 2012 because it made a huge difference in the financial crisis there because you had a lot of creditors that were sitting short bonds that they did not own. So they had that misaligned risk. So that's something we're gonna see come up again and again in this discussion. With regard to the purpose, the reason that this exists is because they're demanded by both financial institutions to hedge and diversify credit risk. The idea is that you can isolate credit risk exposure because if you're like buying a bond, the bond also has rate exposure. You're exposed to interest rates. Here you're isolating the credit aspect of the corporate bond or the sovereign or this other security. So the idea is you have this isolated credit risk that you can't get exposure to in another way. Also, um, the market includes things like hedge funds, investment banks who use it to hedge their positions. And um, again, the whole idea is that you're then going to make credit liquid. Let me go back one. Um, there we go. So to look at some key terms, we see that there are three main types of risks that we wanna distinguish. Firstly, the credit or default risk is the risk of the borrower failing to repay the loan. The counterparty risk is the risk that each side will not follow through. And this is something that has been mitigated by the central clearing counterparty, the CCP. So this is something like ISDA, which is a clearinghouse that's going to be interposed between counterparties to become the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. This ensures that if I actually do sit short a contract and something happens, then in that event of a credit event happening, then what I actually am going to get the payout that I was promised. So it ensures that what is promised actually does happen. Coming out of the crisis, we see um, stricter provisions from ISDA and more central clearing counterparties or more enforcement of those central clearing counterparties, regulations that force CCPs to be used. So the idea is those are our um, mitigating counterparty risk. In addition, we have interest rate risk. So when rates rise, the price of fixed income products obviously decline. This is because of your DB01, your duration, your Macaulay duration, however you wanna look at it. The idea is you have this tangent line approximation for the price and yield curve, and you are you short it. It's like this, and it's like, this is the tangent line approximation. So you have that inverse relationship between price and yields. So when you are along a bond, obviously you're gonna want yields to fall. Um, okay, so the demand universe, we discussed banks, insurance companies, and hedge funds, but why? So banks have a loan book that they wanna hedge. They want to risk manage effectively. They're required based on regulations to risk manage effectively. And the securitization process is the idea of pooling and tranching, which is another way that they use 
products like CDS to get more risk off of their books. In addition, this helps them relax the capital adequacy, which is the regulatory arbitrage, their need that regulators have, that they have um, not too concentrated of credit exposure and not too much credit exposure more broadly. Insurance companies like to buy or sell protection going outdated longer, um, which aligns with their investment objectives. In addition, this will improve their solvency ratios. Uh, hedge funds like to lever up their credit positions. So this gives them a way to sit synthetically long or synthetically short a bond, which means that they have to put up a lot less capital to make that happen. And that basically means that they can do it more, they can do it on a bigger scale and they can do it faster. So they can do it in a more liquid fashion, which is definitely desirable to them. All right, do all of those things make sense? If you have any questions, just ask away. So, so what does it actually mean to sit synthetically long on a bond? So I, I know you can replicate the cash flows, but that's about it. Yes, so we're going to get to that in this slide, actually. So the idea is on the left, you see that when you're a risk seller, which means you are buying protection, you are paying the fee periodically, which means you're synthetically short the bond, which means I have a short position on the bond, like I want the bond to default, but um, I'm sorry, but you are, I'm sorry, you don't want, when you're synthetically short the underlying bond, you don't want, you want the bond to default because yeah, sorry. You want the bond to default because that's when you get paid by this on the left. So the idea is that when you are buying protection, you are paying a fee along the way so that when the default happens, you get paid. So the idea is that you are short the bond because you want it to default because when it defaults, you get paid. When you are a risk seller, you want it to default because you are short the underlying bond synthetically. Does that make sense? Because you don't physically have a bond that you're shorting. It's not like a stock that you're sitting physically short a stock. The idea is that you can't physically short the bond, but this gives you a way to get that same risk exposure where you also want it to default, just like you would if you were actually short a bond. Does that make sense, Shanti? Good. All right, awesome. So as mentioned, um, the idea is that the protection buyer can typically own the credit asset, but does not have to. It is no way obliged to own the credit asset. Coming out of the crisis, now it typically does. Pre-GFC, pre-2008, great financial crisis in 2008, um, people did not sit short the bond. Uh, they did not hold the bond to synthetically short it. So it wasn't buying protection against something that they already had. They just are taking a position that they didn't have. However, this is obviously problematic. Again, big driver for the crisis is because you had a lot of people taking short positions that they did not have aligned incentives for. So it was just essentially betting on random events, um, which is not a position that you'd wanna be in as the debtor on the other side of the equation. So does that make sense for everyone? The difference between being a protection buyer and a protection seller. So protection buyer means you are selling risk, which means you are synthetically short the underlying bond to make things even more complicated. It is called being long the CDS because you are paying that fee periodically. You receive money when there is a credit event and we'll define that in the coming slides. But the idea is CDS are pretty fascinating because there is a limited cash outlay. There are more maturity exposures. There is isolated credit risk, which means that you are not also exposed to interest rate risk or different risks in the markets because you are isolating the credit exposure. You can get foreign credit exposure without having exposure to FX risk because you can have um, a foreign company's credit uh, in US dollars as opposed to having it in a local currency which especially in emerging markets is really significant. We'll see like Argentinian bonds going into the last auction traded in US dollars instead of local uh, instead of local currency. So the idea is that you are getting foreign credit exposure without taking on that FX risk. And obviously in certain places, including emerging markets, they can be more liquid than the underlying cash itself. So things that do default historically a lot, like Argentina, so much more liquid trading in the CDS as opposed to the um, actual underlying cash bonds. 
So just to define, um, it's great to use analogy of an insurance contract. It's not necessarily correct to call it insurance because for something to be considered insurance, you need to actually own the credit asset, which obviously you are not obliged to do. In some situations in the US now you are because of regulatory constraints, but the CDS product in general does not require you to actually own the asset. So it is not technically insurance, but think of it like insurance, you pay a premium. Um, every month, but if my house floods, I'm going to get a payout. So the whole idea is the same as insurance. All right, so what is a credit event? This is definitely important here. So a credit event is a negative change in a borrower's capacity to meet its payments, thus triggering a settlement of a credit default swap. This means that something bad happens, whether that's a default failure to pay, a restructuring or a bankruptcy proceeding. There's a reason that you're not going to see the bond through to maturity, which in turn means that you're going to get that payout from a CDS. So ISDA um, has some sort of form contract that you use when you are writing these contracts and agreeing on them at the initiation date. But they are incredibly bespoke products. They entirely trade over the counter, which means they're not exchange traded, they're over the counter. And the idea there is, Basically, you come up with an idea and that's what you get. So at some price, but if you have an idea, something that you want to swap, there can be a price, there can be a market made for it. If you want to swap the credit risk on something esoteric, you can. So just to define these three terms, they're oftentimes convoluted, but a default just means the failure to pay. So it's the inability of an individual organization to pay their debts on time. So when you see continued defaults, that's gonna be a precursor to bankruptcy. However, those terms are not analogous. Those are not synonymous terms. Um, defaults are only precursors to bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is like a full legal process where there is an inability of an individual or organization to repay its debts. And they say, all right, we are gonna be insolvent. We are not going to repay. And then when you're in bankruptcy uh, proceedings, you could see either like a chapter seven for corporates or a chapter 11, where chapter seven is a fire sale liquidation and chapter 11 would be your corporate reorg. And so that's your corporate restructuring. So the idea behind restructuring is that it is a change in the terms of the debt, which will then make the debt less favorable to debt holders. So that'll decrease the principal amounts paid and that'll probably like lower the coupon rate. The idea is that you were going to have debts that were worth X amount face. And now we're gonna settle them at say in Argentina's case, like 50 bucks, 50 cents on the dollar. And then use that to, I think it was actually 42, 42 cents on the dollar. And then we're gonna take those funds and issue new debt. And the idea is we're not gonna repay your original debt because we can't, so we're gonna change it. Um, and that's what the restructuring process is all about. On the right hand side of the screen, um, you'll see a diagram that we'll touch on a couple of times through this presentation. But the idea is that CDS cash flows before maturity are what we just described with the protection buyer paying a quarterly premium to the protection seller. That means the protection on default is going to go to the protection buyer which means that in physical settlement, so we're gonna get into this in a second as well, but there are two different ways to settle. The idea is put simply, you pay a premium. If something goes wrong, you get a payout. If you're um, in physical settlement, the idea is you are going to deliver the obligation or something substantially similar, which is thoroughly defined and depends on the product, um, depends on the exact contract and depends on the OTC. Uh, obviously it's OTC, so it's very bespoke. But the idea is you are giving a deliverable obligation to the protection seller who then returns you par. So the idea is that difference is going to be your recovery value between uh, par and that deliverable obligation. So again, in cash settlement, that looks like par minus recovery value, which is where you just give the dollar difference. So if par is 100, your recovery value is 42, then it's going to be settled at 58 for this settlement here in cash. If it's settled physically, then you are giving new debt, a new obligation, some other long-term liability or just some other liability in general and receiving par. All right, so for the settlement types, as mentioned, we have the cash and physical settlements. So for cash, there's a dealer pool that establishes the value of the reference obligation. The idea is that is gonna be the recovery value here. 
So once the dealer pool is established, so dealers are places like Citibank or some other sell side institution that actually makes a market on products like this, products that are similar and um, makes a market on most importantly, the underlying reference entity. So whatever that reference entity is, so for Argentinian sovereign uh, CDS, the idea is the reference entity is going to be the Argentinian sovereign bond um, for whatever maturity is equivalent to that CDS contract. But it doesn't have to necessarily be something that simple. It could be literally anything. It could be a single name. It could be a multi-name. So you could say, hey, I have this credit portfolio that is these 10 companies and I want to pay a premium every month so that if they default, I'm protected against all of them. So now I'm paying for a basket. So you can do it on a multi-name basis like that. And there are also things called CDX, which are multi-name baskets as indices. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but the whole idea is it's just a different way that you can bet against the credit. Um, but that should make sense. So the credits, I'm sorry, the cash settlement is described here. And then the physical settlement is here. Physical settlement is the market standard. And the idea is that you can deliver to worse. So what we talked about last week, or I guess two weeks ago, where we mentioned TBA pools and the idea of being to be, uh, to be assigned for mortgage-backed securities is that you have a selection of different securities that can fit the bill, that can be TBA. So there are a lot of different things that could qualify. There are different specific mortgages, different specific pools of mortgages that could qualify for being in this Freddie Gold 5, but you don't have to know exactly which specific pool and you don't get to know. So the idea is that whoever does know because of that informational asymmetry is going to give you whatever the worst is of whatever they have. Like they don't, they're not there to be nice. They're there to make money. They're there to sell you whatever the worst is because you are obliged to buy whatever the worst is that meets a certain minimum standard. So the same is true for physical settlement here. And that does remain the market standard. Does that make sense for everyone, both the diagrams and um, the differences between cash and uh, physical settlement? Uh, yes. Cool. Too fast, too slow. All good. All right. Outstanding. All right, uh, moving on, pricing standards. How on earth do you actually trade these things? So there are three um, things that we want to talk about first. The likelihood and probability of default, which will be denoted as P in the later equations. The loss given default, which is the idea of the recovery value. So as mentioned here, you have par minus recovery value. So what is that loss going to, be, uh, loss going to default? The loss, uh, loss. A given default, sorry, your LGD, what is your LGD value going to be? Par minus the recovery value. How much is that value? And then you also want to note things, obviously, being an exchange traded security like liquidity, regulatory, and market sentiment, because you don't want a regulatory environment changing while you have this contract. Um, liquidity, obviously, the more liquid these are, the easier you can get out of them. Problem is oftentimes you only have one counterparty because you are trading, at least for the more bespoke things, you're trading basically directly, you're trading through a CCP, but you are effectively directly going to a counterparty. Um, all right, so the way that it's quoted is in terms of a premium, which is also denoted as a spread. This is the annual number of basis points of a contract's notional value, however, Although this is the annual number, it is typically paid quarterly, which means every year it is paid four times. If you look at the diagrams below, we'll see the differences between a protection buyer's role and a protection seller's. So you have the reference bond making the payments and then for the delivery there. Just remember, uh, most important thing is they're quoted in terms of their premiums and premiums are a percentage of notional value that is going to be paid quarterly, but quoted annually. Um, that's annoying, but I guess typical of fixed income markets. 
All right, so discrete time pricing formulas. These are the um, kind of easier ways to visualize what's going on here from a mathematical sense. Again, the CDS spread is the premium that is going to be paid quarterly. It's the annual figure of the premium that is paid quarterly. This equates the present value of all premium payments to the present value of the expected default loss. The idea is the premium rate is going to be the notional times one minus P, which is one minus the probability of default, times S, which is going to be that payment amount, divided by one plus R, which is going to be your discounting mechanism. The idea is that for the expected default loss, it's gonna be pretty similar. And then in terms of getting to what that premium number is, that S value is the number that you are actually exchanging, that quarterly premium, is going to be the equivalent of that formula there, which will be P, uh, P times um, one minus R, which will be the recovery rate there. So that should make sense. And then just mathematical reorganization to use knowing what that coupon rate is to kind of back out what the probability of default is. And that's something that is often used in other types of fixed income derivatives. Like if you're going to price an option or something more exotic, also based on the same reference entity, then you'd want to be able to use these um, pricing measures and this probability measure here to figure out what that is. So this should be pretty simple. The whole idea is obviously you want the notional times probability of not defaulting um, times whatever that premium is every month, obviously in basis points, uh, I'm sorry, every quarter, every four months, every three months um, in basis points, and then just discounted that. So for continuous time pricing formulas, we'll see that you need to not, you need to have a little bit more um, information. The idea is that you have a continuous compounded interest rate, RT, you have S, which is that premium rate that's going to be paid continuously. Um, modeling this in continuous time is a bit weird, obviously, because these payments are not made continuously but using a poison process with uh, the lambda t, we take like infinitely small time intervals, which is lambda t times delta t. And the probability that the entity survives is going to be that s of t function. And then your default probability is q of t. So, um, I don't necessarily want to get into why this is, but I guess the proof of which is up to the listener as an exercise, but there's a lot more information and I can direct you to resources that will explain it a lot better than I can try to, but these are the formulas. The whole idea is it's going to be the difference between the premium and protection, and you're going to use that to get to S, which is going to be the CDS spread, CDS spread S, and um, this obviously is going to use the assumption of having a flat CDS curve if you're looking to the last one. And the idea there is that over time, your CDS is going to be constant um, in terms of your, I'm sorry, no, you're not, not necessarily your CDS, but your probability of default will be the same for every T in the range of the inclusive interval T to T plus delta T. But that's not necessarily a valid assumption, which is why you'd want to use the formula above that goes into the expected value. And then you um, use that continuous time process. And again, I can direct you to resources that will explain it a lot better. But hopefully this makes sense here. It should be pretty logical. The whole idea is you've got the difference between um, the present value of uh, premium payments to the present value of the expected default loss. And if you take 21,270, you'll go through exercises like this pretty often as well. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So CDX, the credit default indices. IHS market publishes CDX. Um, as mentioned, we have the single credit, multi-credit and CDS index, which is the CDX which are different ways that you can package CDS. The idea is they make eight different indices right now. Um, they used to do something as well called an LCDX, which was a loan CDX. This was way pre-crisis. Not surprisingly, this performed incredibly poorly going into the financial crisis. So that is not something that they do anymore. 
Um, but with regard to CDX, we see two blocks here in the high yield, the single B and double B high yield CDX, which are the North American high yield B, North American high yield BB. And then with regard to the high yield side, they break it down into industries, um, different sector groups, and also have a high volatility uh, arrangement there. In addition, the reason that CDX are useful is that they are exchange traded. There's 125 names and they're updated every six months based on if companies are changing between being high yield or not. Um, they have it broken down that way. And the whole way that you purchase CDX, and we don't necessarily need to get into it now, but the whole idea is that you can pay a certain premium for a certain amount of risk protection. So it's like how we talked about um, the different capital structure arrangements for MBS that you pay um, more of a premium to go up higher in the default blocks. So the whole idea, like when you have a AAA bond at the top of MBS, that's a lot safer. So you're gonna accept a much, um, much lower coupon as opposed to the higher coupon riskier stuff down here. So that same concept applies. It's actually sold in chunks, but the most important thing to take away is that there are 125 names starting in 2002. And because it is exchange traded, it is a lot more liquid than these OTC contracts than you would see in the um, CDS single name or multi-credit universe. All right, so that kind of finishes out um, these credit derivatives, the credit CDS and CDX. If no one has any questions, it'll be good to move on to other swaps. All right, take one second. All right, exciting. Uh, interest rate swaps. So the idea is you are exchanging funds between a lender and um, a borrower where a lender makes a loan to a borrower who then makes a fixed rate interest rate payments to a counterparty. The counterparty then gives a variable interest rate payment, which is an IBOR, which is either a LIBOR or um, like a US dollar LIBOR, um, something in that family right now. It'll become SOFR for interest rate swaps in the US at the end of 2021, which is currently planned. We'll see if that holds, um, obviously given the current frictions in the market environment, but they still say that they're going ahead with that transition. And the idea is it is a fixed versus floating swap. It's a simple derivative contract. The idea is lender makes a loan and they are giving a fixed rate payment to a counterparty, but they are going to receive a variable. This makes up the largest component of the OTC derivative market. And then um, just to touch on alternative rates, if the rate is an overnight index, which is a lot more um, short term and it's, um, I don't actually know the distinction between, I know they're calculated differently and used for different things, but, the whole idea is that if it is using an overnight index swap, then you are going to use an OIS um, if it is on that overnight index rate. So if that's an Eonia, which is the Europe one, um, the Sonia in the UK, or the FOIS, then it becomes an OIS, but it's the same idea. It is fixed versus floating leg. Um, so not surprisingly, to calculate the price of an interest rate swap, you take your fixed rate and then subtract your float rate. So that means your sum of your discounted value of payments that you know on your fixed side at the top times your notional value um, should equate to your float plus that premium. So your float rate is going to be your notional times whatever that value is of your float rate at that time. Obviously that's not something that is going to be known right now. And usually it's based on like three month forward contracts of, uh, I'm sorry, three month futures contracts of the LIBOR or um, different IBOR rates. All right, total return swaps. So these are along the same lines. So the diagrams on the right show both during the swap and at maturity. During the swap, the total return swap payer um, has coupons from the reference asset, which go to the total return swap receiver. The whole idea here is that you have an asset that has a payoff, whether that's like a bond, a portfolio of possibly equities, um, could be a diversified portfolio. 
you have something that's going to get you a return and you want to switch it with someone else for typically a floating rate. So the receiver is going to make um, payments at a set rate or a floating rate, and then the pair will make payments at um, of that reference asset rate. And so the receiving party is going to collect any income that's generated by the asset, but they do not actually own the asset. So legally, the total return pair owns the asset. And because of that, they can actually um, sell it out in a repo, but we don't necessarily need to get into that now. The idea is that the receiver is going to assume both systematic and credit risks, and the receiver benefits from the assets return without actually having to own it. The receiving party then pays a set rate over the life of the swap, and the pair assumes no performance risk, but takes on that credit exposure. But something interesting to note here is that the receiver benefits um, obviously from having the return without owning it, which means that the payer still does own it, which means that they can then use it to maintain capital adequacy requirements when they have a certain amount of tier one, tier two, tier three capital that they need. And they can also basically sell the return to someone else, but also keep the asset that they need to um, increase their capital adequacy rates. So when you, as the payer, pay coupons from the reference asset to the receiver, you're gonna receive a LIBOR and a fixed spread, um, which would put it on uh, just like a LIBOR plus a fixed, which obviously is gonna be floating because LIBOR is a floating rate. Um, you could also do this with a fixed, uh, fixed uh, spread, I guess not even a fixed spread, just a fixed rate where you don't have any sort of floating component. In addition, the total receiver, uh, the total return swap pair um, will give any increase in the market value of the notional uh, value of the asset to the receiver, and then any decrease in the market value will be paid back. So obviously, just to settle that difference at maturity. All right, one more swap to talk about here. We have the cross currency basis swap. So the idea is that you can do three things with it. You can purchase cheaper debt, you can hedge against foreign exchange risk, or basically defend against financial, a financial crisis as a sovereign, because countries can get income by letting others borrow their currency. There are interest in principal payments in one currency, exchange for interest in principal in a different currency. However, the um, kind of periodic difference in interest versus principal payments is very interesting to note. The periodic payments throughout the life of the swap are um, just interest only. So the idea is there's three stages. At the outset, you are going to exchange funds. Someone's gonna borrow and someone's gonna lend. Afterwards, you're going to pay interest and receive interest. And then at the end, you're just gonna receive principal and your principal rate is gonna be at the same. The idea is that you are able to invest in another currency through this basis swap. So you are able to invest in corporate bonds in this other country that are denominated in this currency. You are able to invest in sovereign bonds. You're able to garner exposure to whole new asset classes in another country. You could do it with a Euro and then start buying European CNDS or some other esoteric product or uh, I guess that's pretty vanilla, but you can swap it with funds that are pretty much anywhere and use that to help you, um, I guess, essentially garner higher exposures and purchase cheaper debt and earn a higher return. Again, these contracts, like all these discussed, are over the counter, which means they are bespoke. They're variable, fixed, or um, could be some combination of both with regard to your LIBOR rates. Um, depicted there, you can have, um, you can basically customize these contracts however you can get someone to write them. Does that make sense? Is everyone with me? All right, outstanding. Um, so let's talk about the repo market. The repo market is along the same lines as a swap. We're going to walk through an example with MBS um, paper just to tie it back to our discussion last week. Ideas you can have secured lending, which is going to be usually cheaper than unsecured borrowing by about LIBOR minus 10 basis points. 
There are five terms I want to define on the right. Firstly, collateral. Collateral, um, when you're doing a repo with um, mortgage-backed securities, can be all agency. It could be AAA or AA non-agency CMOs. It could be AA pass-throughs. It could be a whole loan. And the seller receives, very importantly, the identical collateral at the end of the term. And there's a haircut that is used by the lender, which is the buyer, to hedge against the decline in the market, uh, in the market value of this security, usually around one or two percent. You can see situations where it goes up to 40 or 50, but it's usually around one or two. And the securities are marked to market daily, um, obviously leading to mar uh, margin calls. Uh, being margin calls, they're going to be cash settled, which will be T plus zero. You'll see other contracts like typically those on FX desks being settled T plus two. So for terms, you can see them overnight, just one day, or you can see them more than one day for term repos, or um, you can see a series of overnights renewed daily at a new rate, which is called being open. In addition, um, we have title. Title represents ownership stakes, so the borrower will lose title to the security over the repo period. But all payments of principal, scheduled and unscheduled, are forwarded to the original buyer. Um, so that contrasts what we spoke about earlier. And we also have the idea of a reverse repo, where the buyer, who's the lender of funds, can repo out the securities to borrow money. This is dubbed a repo book situation. When you look at the diagram on the top left, you see that the seller is giving them the security and then the buyer is giving them cash. At the end, they return um, the security and get the cash plus um, a premium. The premium represents the cost of funds, which again is going to be cheaper than unsecured borrowing. If you look to the description below, it'll walk through how you take the par amount, multiply it by the factor, and then um, take the bid price, obviously adjusting for the accrual um, times one minus that haircut. So that haircut in the example is going to be that 5% there. Um, okay, I think that makes sense. Obviously you do have credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, and settlement risk, which are gonna be imperative even as you move into the universe of dollar rolls. Dollar rolls are an alternative form of repo for mortgage-backed securities. And I just wanted to bring this up again after our discussion two weeks ago, because it's very important to be able to distinctively identify the differences between a repo and a dollar roll, because in dollar rolls, you can actually get, um, you can actually get a different security back. So you can get something that's substantially similar, but not the same. And this goes hand in hand with the, with the discussion we had earlier about delivery to worst. Delivery to worst is the idea that when you have that physical settlement, they don't have to give you the same security back. So they're gonna give back something substantially similar. They're gonna give back some sort of obligation to um, either subsidiary, a third party obligation that the company's under or an obligation to the company itself. But you don't know which of those it's gonna be. So they are gonna deliver to worst. So if you have experience looking at dollar rolls and knowing that they also deliver to worst, then that'll go hand in hand with um, your understanding of physical settlement for these um, CDS that we discussed. All right, does that make sense for everyone? We good? Cool. All right. Just to wrap it up, um, 40 minutes, okay. Um, just to wrap it up and paint the full picture, the idea is that you have these four swap products that we spoke about, the total return swap, the CDS, the cross-currency basis, and the interest rate swap. With the total return swap, obviously you're taking an underlying asset, you're giving that cash flow to the total return payer, and then they're earning that rate of return, um, going to give it with interest and appreciation to the total return receiver. And then in return, they will get that floating rate, which will be your LIBOR plus a spread. On the CDS side, you have two things to look at. Firstly, if there is not a credit event, um, quarterly or periodically, you'll have a payment of CDS premium. And then if a CDS um, credit event does occur, as previously defined, you'll either have delivery of a reference obligation which will be like either a corporate bond, which will be for 
their company itself, some sort of subsidiary or some sort some um, third party obligation, again, delivery to worse there, or have some sort of cash payment of par value. You'll have the CDS protection seller receive that delivery and then um, collect the spread with the protection buyer. Basically, when you're buying protection, you're buying insurance. You're going to be safer. You pay a premium, but when something bad happens, you are protected. The cross-currency basis swap um, is a three-part process. Firstly, with the exchange of principal plus at the spot rate. During the term, you have the difference between the interest payments being paid back and forth. So this can be done on sovereign bonds. It can be also done on different products within. And then when you near maturity or when you hit maturity exactly, you will have um, this exchange of principal. So interest in the middle, principal at the end. Principal will typically, unless contractually specified otherwise, be exchanged at the original um, spot rate. And then for the interest rate swap, we have the whole idea of a company, um, a fixed rate from creditors, and then the company giving a floating rate to the bank and then um, getting a fixed rate back. All right, outstanding. So those are swaps. Does anyone have any questions about any of it? <laughs>